Thank you, Marion. Well, our parish of this week is entitled Pinchas, and you're going to hear all about him, but let me just remind you where Moses and the Israelites are. They're on the brink of entering into obtaining, fighting for, or achieving the promised land. Uh, Aaron and Miriam has passed on, and This parasha is basically divided into two main sections, which rabbis today, previously, and in ancient times discussed. Firstly, it starts with the story of Pinchas. Now, the Israelites, having been saved by God from Bilam's curse, if you remember, and our talking donkey of last week, felt fell headlong into the trap that was set for them because you see Balaam really did not have good intentions even though Hashem put different words in his mouth and often people speak beautiful words but they don't wish you well inside and it's sometimes difficult to understand that but what he did is as soon as he could he got the woman of the of, of, of the Midianite tribes to seduce the men and a terrible plague happened. So let's see what it says here. The Israelites had been saved by God from Bilam's curses fell headlong into the trap that Bilam had set for them. They began consorting with Midianite women and were soon worshipping other gods. God's anger burned. He ordered the death of the people the people's leaders, and a plague raged. 24,000 of the Israelites died. A leading Israelite, Zimri, brought a Midianite woman, Cosby, and cohabitated, you know what that means, in full view to defy Moses and the people. It was the most brazen of acts. Pinchas, who was an Israelite leader himself of one of the tribes, took a spear and drove it through them both. They died and the plague stopped. Right. I'm going to be just spend a couple of minutes discussing this because this is very controversial. Was Pinchas a hero or was he a murderer? On the one hand, he saved countless lives. No more people died after the plague. Remember, this is this now is like an allegory. We've got to try and take a message from this. So there's great discussions on this. Uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory, like many, many rabbis, finds ways of saying that this was not breaking halakha because halakha says thou shalt not murder. And there's no exception to that. On the other hand, Rabbi Sachs of Blessed Memory and other many rabbis try and separate this from the laws of halakha and say no. It fell outside the laws of Halakha, and it was more of a political decision. Uh, and they try and condone it like that. In Judaism, there is a fair, sphere known as Mishpat Melach, which is not Halakha laws, which go back to the Ten Commandments, but is the legal domain of the king. Who was the king at that time? It would have been Moses. But Moses did nothing. And Pinchas decided, right, he's going to take things into his own hands and kill these two people. And there's a lot of uh, disagreement about this, especially today. To kill anyone without first going through a, a process, a legal process, according to Halakha, is wrong. All right, so let's say it was a political decision, and therefore, I suppose one could really 
uh, defended on that basis on that if you have to kill a few to save the lives of thousands, is that justified? I don't know. If you see this in that light, it is. And I'm going to just be very brief on this and say that the head of progressive Judaism today, who is a, a, a wonderful rabbi, and you can access his drosha on this, I think Jacob does put it on us, us uh, on our information, Rabbi Rick Jacobs. Today, he's taking a very different look at Pinchas. And he's saying, even though in the Torah, it is said that God saw Pinchas as a hero because he took the role of leadership when Moses stood back. Uh, they also try and explain it that Moses married a midnight woman, but that's not the same as taking one and worshiping worship foreign God because the midnight woman that Moses married with Zipporah immediately became Jewish and followed his way. So any, anyway, uh, Rabbi Rick Jacobs disagrees with the great Rabbi Jonathan Sachs. I'm just putting them together and says we should see this today as the act of a zealot, a zealot and put it in the same category as the orthodox, ultra-orthodox Jew who killed Rabin. There are arguments back and forth about this, and I'm not going to go into it. I would just like to say that I think both, both arguments are very valid. And I think both arguments are for the sake of heaven. And therefore, we should delve into it more deeply. And like with Shammai and Hillel say, both have great merit. And it depends on you which you feel more comfortable with. But both arguments are for the sake of heaven. I would rather just quickly and briefly discuss the other aspect of this uh, parasha that most people find fascinating, and so do I. And that is the quality of leadership. Because after this episode with Pinchas, killing these two people and the plague stopping, Moses has an incredible discussion with Hashem to say to Hashem, almost challenge him, look, I know I'm not going to go into the land of Israel. As you know, he is allowed to see it. But he has a discussion where this is the first time in Torah that it says, instead of God spoke to Moses, Moses spoke to God. Now, again, that shows the incredible quality of a relationship between the Jewish people and the God they have chosen and who has chosen them. Because he spoke to God, he initiated it, and he demanded almost <laughs> to be reassured that who was to follow him. He was not concerned that he himself would not gain to end. The sages think he must have been disappointed. But you and I know that A, uh, at, it, it's not that at his age, you needed a new mindset to, for the people to, to go into the promised land, a completely new mindset. They weren't going to be faced with the same challenges in the desert. They were going to be faced with going through different tribes, with, with conquering with, with, with setting up laws, et cetera, in reality. And so they, and I'll conclude with this, there are some great qualities of leadership that we should think about. A, ourselves, when we decide, uh, maybe we've had enough of a position, <laughs> I hope I'll do this when I'm not chair of Temple Israel, but also because today, if you look at the world today, it is very, very appropriate to look at how a leader resigns, whether they kicked out or not. Do they resign or leave their post? For example, Boris Johnson. Uh, for example, who just ran away uh, from, from, from one of the, the, the countries? I think it was in the Middle East. Uh, 
I'm not sure which one, but a leader just ran away. Sri Lanka, Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka, thank you, yes. A leader but ran in away. Afghanistan in Afghanistan as well. The, in that's, Afghanistan as yeah, well when the yeah, Taliban thank came you. in. Okay, 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 hold on. I've got to finish in time. They'll... That they, I don't know what they'll do to me, Jacob, if I don't. But thank you, Hilda. It was Sri Lanka I was thinking of specifically. Here, yeah, a leader ran away before he was assassinated. What about the new government in Israel? How did Netanyahu, how did he react when he either was forced to or in the transition about? Right. Thank you for that, Hilda. So let us just have a look at the qualities that Moses showed, knowing he had to leave his flock. Number one, he took stock of his accomplishments and where the community was going. Number two, he immediately spoke up. In Here he spoke to God and said, right, let's decide now who's going to follow me because he was so concerned about his people. He wasn't worried about himself. Think of the leadership I've mentioned. Boris Johnson, how did he resign? The chap from Sri Lanka ran away. How did Netanyahu leave his post? How did Bennett lose? And we can go on and on. How is Putin doing? So, so let's just see. So Moses spoke to God saying, as I said, tell me who's going to be my successor. Number three. He was very concerned about who his successor was. And God had to assure him that Joshua was the right person. And we're going to see why it was Joshua, the right person. Because they were looking for a person. And in Hebrew, it is Ish Asher Ruach Bo. It's someone who has a spirit inside him, a spirit that cared about God's laws and the people. And then they suggested that publicly, that it's very important that as you leave, you endorse the next leader. Now let's just think of some leaders who are leaving now and have they these qualities? Are they gracious? Will they endorse the next leader? So in Parashat Pinchas, God and Moses are preparing for a national transition. And these few guidelines are applicable today to a congregation, to an organization, to a school, to a group, to a business. But there was one beautiful quality that I'd like to just conclude with. And uh, this is a quality particularly that uh, the late Jonathan Sachs, who, who defended the act of killing, while other rabbis didn't. He said that the very important quality of Moses, and we all know this, is that he was described as a great man, Hakadol. At the same time, he was very humble. How can these two qualities really go together? Uh, very difficult to find them in today's leadership. And so he said, Rashi noted that Moses as well, and it tells you in the discussion of what type of leader should follow him, it, it's a leader who should be able to deal with all the different types of people in his, in, 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 in his congregation, in his tribe, in the Israelites, because all of us have completely different ideas. We have different strengths. We have different weaknesses. And a leader must be able to find the strength of each person in their team and bring that out and, and overlook perhaps the weaknesses. And I, that is very good. And the Rambam also said that this is probably the most difficult quality of leadership to be able to work in a nice way and not upset anyone and not point out their weaknesses, but rather look at their strengths and, and try to uh, hide their weaknesses uh, in a way. But the loveliest one is that where most people have interpreted Mo, uh, Ish, the name Ish was given the man Moses, Moshe Ish, there is another interpretation to Ish. 
and as I as I read to you, Ish, take for yourself a person, Joshua, and the word Ish here is not used to describe, in some rabbis' opinion, a man, whereas Ish is traditionally a man. But here it says it is something other than gender. The phrase Ha Ish Moshe, many people can interpret as the man Moses, but Ish in the context of, context of leadership is not male nor female, but rather someone who is a mensch, is a person whose greatness is worn lightly, like Moses. He was great, but he was very humble. So Ish may not always mean a man. It rather means, what well, the only way I can describe it is a mensch, someone who cares about people, perhaps people that other people ignore, the orphan, the widow, the stranger, who spends as much time with the people at the margins of society as with the elite. I'm reading to you the words now of Jonathan Sachs, who is courteous to everyone equally and who receives respect because they give respect. And it reminds me of that magnificent poem, Desiderata, if you could walk with kings, nor lose your common touch, and you can speak in the same way to a beggar. So, and that is for many sages and many rabbis, the greatest quality that Moses showed in discussing with Hashem, and it's very interesting, I would suggest you read it, the leader who was to follow him. All he cared about was not himself. He had achieved his purpose, but he cared so much that the right leader would be after him, would also have that spirit, that humility, that, that love of not only people in power, but perhaps the people on the fringes of society. Shabbat Shalom, back to